Welcome everyone to the Beta Shares Market Update. Are we approaching a recession with myself, Chris Yates, the director here at Beta Shares, and of course, David Bassanese, our chief economist. As always, I'll just give everyone a quick moment to read the disclaimer and obviously just highlighting there, past performance is not an, or not indicative of future performance. Perfect. The webinar will be recorded today, um, so you will be getting this sent out shortly at the conclusion of this. And also, please do take the time to write through questions as David goes through the differing topics today, as we will have some time to answer those at the end. To keep on top of all our webinars, content, new ETFs, um, content in terms of what David uh, puts out in our portfolio management team, you can do that quite easily uh, by jumping on either our Twitter page, LinkedIn, Facebook, and of course, a lot of our videos on investing and markets are on um, YouTube as well. Just a quick beta shares update. Hopefully the majority of people attending the webinar today already know us, but we have over 70 plus ETF strategies here listed in Australia. As of uh, yesterday, we're a shade over $22 billion under, under management and of course, we're always looking to provide intelligent investment solutions to help Australian investors meet their objectives. The man of the moment that's been going to be going through our webinar today, of course, is our chief economist here at, Dave, uh, at BetaShares, Dave Bassanese. And again, his sole uh, job here at BetaShares is really developing economic insights for portfolio and portfolio construction strategies. So the key topics today, um, an economic update, they would be looking broadly across what is driving, I guess, inflation, the key question to a lot of economies at the moment, and also some other risk in the market around China in terms of the property market there, and also Ukraine and Russia. Interest rate outlooks and the Australian dollar, uh, they would be also covering this, and then looking at share markets, specifically around the US, what is that? Where is that price currently? What have we seen over the last 12 to 24 months and potentially what isn't quite priced in in terms of earnings? And finally, finishing up with some investment themes, if you believe that we are in for, I guess, turbulent times and potential um, downward markets, what are some um, ETFs that you can potentially position in your portfolio to help protect that? And again, as I mentioned, we will have plenty of time at the end to go through any questions that you write um, through the webinar today. But David, um, conscious of time, I'll put it across to you and I'll join later. Thank you. No worries, great Chris and great to be with you all today uh, for a bit of a, a, an update in view of the market volatility. It's a bit of an unusual uh, webinar or a bit different from our normal hour long webinar. So it's going to be short and sharp. They've tried to uh, ask me to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, um, which is uh, usually it's hard to get me to stop at 45 minutes. So we'll see how we go today, but we want to leave enough time for, for questions. So I'll get right into it. Uh, just with the terms of uh, uh, well, economic update, but also a market update. So here are the major trends uh, across markets at the moment. As you can see that the equity markets, you know, still remain under downward pressure. Basically, the uh, the global equity indice there, you can see still trending down. These are monthly, end month uh, valuations. Uh, and at the same time, bond yields still trending higher. So 10-year bond yields there uh, in the US can see are going up. So the story of the year so far has been this upward pressure on interest rates uh, due to aggressive central bank tightening, which is in turn due to the, the uplift in inflation post-COVID, uh, which has uh, at the moment pushed down equity valuations. Um, Earnings, expect to, earnings have been holding up so far, but it's been that PE ratio coming down, which has been pushing down um, equities. Now, the question going forward is, you know, do you get the next leg of the down market um, if higher interest rates eventually cause a slowdown in the economy and potentially a recession uh, in the US? And that is the concern at the moment. US dollar still going higher. Uh, and Aussie dollar going lower, as you can see at the bottom there, and commodity prices, this has been an interesting one, that oil prices are, are actually off and commodity prices broadly have started to come off uh, since around mid-year. Sorry, the echo, we'll fix that in a sec. Yeah, uh, so commodity prices have started to come off, you know, in anticipation of a slowdown in the economy, um, whereas earnings expectation of the market, not as yet. But that is the state of play at the moment. Uh, so just quickly, so the US market, as at the low a couple of days ago, was off 25% from its peak. Uh, the NASDAQ has had uh, at its recent low uh, at the end of last week is off 34% from its peak. 
um, at the end of last year. And the Australian market's been holding up somewhat better, but nonetheless down. Uh, and so its peak to trough decline um, is around about 16% or so. So still down, but certainly less down than what we've seen in the United States market. Um, inflation in the US, I mean, this has been a development in the past couple of months. We, we did get a hopeful measure a couple of months ago where the inflation number uh, was a bit lower than expected. Uh, but the last couple of months have proved to be higher than expected, and particularly the uh, the um, August reading for the US, um, the the PCE here is a consumption deflator, and it came out at 0.6% in the month, um, which was uh, quite a bit higher than what the market expected, and that led to the uh, recent increase in interest rates, uh, which in turn led to the recent uh, uh, decline in the, um, the the equity market. So the inflation story in the US uh, is still proving. Uh, challenging. Again, inflation has peaked. There's no question that inflation has peaked. It's just how quickly these, these rates of inflation can come down. The Fed wants to, to come down to around about 2% within the next couple of years, um, ideally without a recession, but uh, I think the markets are slowly concluding that you probably will need to get at least a mild recession in the US uh, to ensure that inflation comes down. But that's the state of play at the moment, uh, that it is coming off, but it's still uncomfortably high. Meanwhile, globally, we've got the ongoing tensions. Um, you know, the China situation is still playing out. Um, we're hoping, you know, for stimulus uh, to come through to uh, support the property sector. We're hoping they can move away from the zero um, uh, COVID strategy they have at the moment. Uh, so the economy is under pressure, but markets, I guess, at the moment do remain hopeful that um, the, the China will eventually um, start to focus on reviving its economy and focusing on growth. Uh, and it may well be over the coming, you know, six to, to 12 months that the Western economies, Europe, uh, the US are going to a downturn, but maybe China actually has a bit of an uplift because it will go against the, the fold and, and, and start to, to stimulate its economy. But at the moment, uh, it's still, um, you know, we, we're still in a juggling act. Uh, obviously, the Russia-Ukraine tensions, I'm sure many of you are across that situation, seems to be an ongoing war of attrition, though, of course, Ukraine have made some recent uh, encouraging um, uh, territorial, um, you know, um, claim back some territory. Russia seems under pressure. Uh, the only, you know, like, well, the only one of many, but, you know, will, will, will they eventually resort to nuclear weapons? I mean, that seems to be the the, the measure of last resort for, for, for Putin, or will it be the case that someone eventually does, you know, lead to regime change in, in Russia, uh, he is toppled and then they have a negotiated uh, settlement. And, and Ukraine have recently said they are prepared to talk, uh, but just not with Putin. So it's really up to Russia to decide whether, you know, whether anyone there has the, you know, capacity to, 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 um, uh, to cause change at the top. Otherwise, it's going to be an ongoing war of attrition um, with, you know, that, I guess, that tail risk of, of, a, of a potential, even a tactical nuclear strike seems hard to believe, but, you know, something that can be confined to a, you know, a sort of a, a very small area of um, the Ukraine. But, I mean, if Russia were to do that, I mean, who knows what the consequences would be, but it would be a massive risk off event, certainly for global markets, uh, were that were to happen. Uh, in Australia, closer to home, the inflation story also a bit uh, still challenging. So the un the trim mean, that's the underlying measures running at 4.9%. Um, big difference between Australia and the US as I get into is wages growth here still remains fairly benign. And that's, uh, I think, one of the reasons behind the RBA shift uh, just recently, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, but if you look at the economy, this is a chart of retail spending, like uh, uh, volumes of spending in the, in the Australian economy, so allowing for inflation. So it's an inflation adjusted measure of retail spending. And as you can see, we've had the downturns associated with both the original COVID lockdown, then the Omicron related lockdowns late last year. But what we've seen is once the economies are, uh, you know, the social distancing restrictions, the working from home restrictions are less uh, are removed, uh, spending bounces back very strongly. So we're currently enjoying a very solid uh, upturn in consumer spending um, and also employment. But again, I don't have time to go through all of that. But suffice to say, the economy at the moment is still humming along reasonably well, although the property sector is con uh, con uh, contracting. Um, well, there's certainly house prices are coming off. And that's a theme basically in the US and Australia at the moment is that things like consumer spending, uh, employment growth, are actually at the moment still fa uh, proving fairly resilient 
uh, to the increase in interest rates we've seen to date, uh, although we have seen house prices uh, and demand for housing start to come off. So the most interest rate sensitive sector uh, in both economies has come off, um, but the, 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 the bulk of the economy, i.e. consumer spending and employment growth broadly, are uh, still holding up at the moment. Uh, and that, you know, I think uh, the, the, the concern is, is that may well be the next leg to turn down uh, under the weight of interest rate increases if inflation uh, does remain uh, stubbornly high. In terms of house prices, um, I can give you an update here. This chart is a little bit out of date. We just got a, a, a reading lately. So nationwide, according to the core logic measure of house prices, uh, we're off 5.5% uh, from their peak back in April. Um, it's, it's saying 4.2% now, but it's actually 5.5. In Sydney, uh, the decline is 9%. Uh, Melbourne, 5.6. Brisbane, 4.3. Adelaide and Perth, uh, somewhat smaller declines, only about 0.3.6. So the bigger declines at the moment are in those major capital cities of Sydney uh, and Melbourne. Uh, and the likelihood is we are going to get more downside to come. I mean, my, my base case nationally has been something of the order of 10 to 15. Uh, so at the moment, we're probably one third of the, the adjustment through uh, in terms of house prices nationally. And in areas like Sydney and Melbourne, it could be somewhat bigger. You know, Sydney already down nine. It could be up to 15 to 20 potentially uh, in Sydney, given the uh, expensiveness that it got to, how expensive it got to. Just quickly, I, I've, I've got a, a lot, about five minutes left or so in the presentation, but I did want to highlight again one of the big differences between Australia and the United States, which is important when we talk about the risk of a recession uh, and the risk of you know, how aggressive interest rates will be. Um, you can see at the top chart there, unemployment in both economies is still similar, around about three and a half percent. Wages growth, if you look at the bottom chart, is still uh, you know, quite a bit different. So uh, when the, 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 na the, the, I guess the, the national official wage measure is the wage price index, or the wage cost index, and the annual growth rate for that is 2.6%. Now, a similar measure in, in the United States is, is running at over 5%. Um, and as I've alluded to in earlier presentations, one of the reasons for that is that employment growth, uh, participation in the labour market has bounced back quite nicely uh, in Australia post-COVID, whereas it's been a bit more begrudging uh, in the United States. Many people have chosen to, to retire, not come back into the workforce, and businesses uh, have just been uh, uh, scrambling to uh, re-attract workers back into the workforce. They've had to jack up wages to do that uh, in the US, whereas because of the job subsidy scheme, arguably in Australia, um, people went back to their previous jobs somewhat more quickly and easily, and so we, businesses haven't had to scramble and jack up wages nationally uh, to get that, that employment response. So that's a major difference, and it's why the RBA, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Oh, the other, sorry, and the other element in terms of Australia versus the US is that, as you can see, second line there, a lot more, oh, sorry, the first bar there, something like 80% of Australian housing loans are variable rate, uh, whereas in the US, uh, most are, are fixed rate. Um, and so that means is when interest rates go up and the, uh, the variable rate goes up in Australia, it has a, it has a, um, uh, a, you know, a, a bigger, a quicker impact on household um, uh, financing, uh, household, um, uh, you know, after tax income and after mortgage income. Whereas in the US, many people are on fixed rates. So even if interest rates goes up because their fixed rates don't go up automatically, um, then they don't get that sort of same hit that, that most households in Australia do with a mortgage. So it's another reason why to argue that our economy is more sensitive to short-term interest rates, uh, which means in turn, maybe we don't need to put them up as much to have a, a given impact in terms of slowing the economy and containing inflation. Um, in terms of interest rates, now this has been a, a, a you know certainly a shift. So the RBA yesterday raised rates by 25 basis points, 0.25%. Uh, the market was widely expecting a, another move of 0.5%. Um, and the reason they've done that is they, they figure interest rates are now back up to their so-called neutral levels. Um, you know, more normal levels, if you like, just over 2%. So now that they can go at a slower pace and just assess how the economy, you know, take a bit more time to see the impact of these rate rises, um, you know, to what extent it will lead to slowing of growth and, and inflation um, and, you know, reduce the risk of overkill, you know, going too far too fast and causing an undue slowdown. So I think that's been a healthy development. 
um, from the RBA. It's something I argued for. I actually thought they would go by 50 yesterday because it was fully priced into the market and I thought they might take that opportunity to, to still go by 50. So I, I didn't get that call right, but I certainly would have preferred them to go by 25 and they actually did go by 25. And you can see my schedule now. I've got the RBA raising rates they're still going to be raising rates and they said, said as much in their statement. So my base case is they raise rates another 25 points in November uh, and December, taking the uh, cash rate up to about 3.1% by year end. And then a, a final, uh, a final uh, rate rise next year, taking that cash rate up to about 3.35%. And as you can see on the slide there, the markets are close to that now. I mean, but, but and markets have come down. I mean, only you know, only yesterday the markets are expecting the cash rate in the middle of next year uh, to be up up around 4% or so, which I always thought was uh, unlikely and unnecessary. Now they're coming closer, they're coming down closer to sort of my view of where I see the cash rate eventually getting to next year. Uh, look, less uh, good news on the US front. Um, we're still looking at aggressive interest rate increases, um, around about 4.5% on the cash rate by next year. So, uh, potentially another 75 points at the next meeting in November, uh, and then another 50 points at the meeting in December. Uh, that would take you up to one, another 1.25% 1 increase. And then I've penciled in a final uh, increase by the Fed next year, but I think by that stage we should get enough signs of a slowing, uh, if not potential recession for them to then um, you know, not need to raise rates any further, and that should have an impact. And you can see um, in terms of the market pricing there, um, it's close to sort of what I expect the, the Fed to do. The, I mean, that is sort of priced into the market already. Um, uh, so again, in terms of bond yields and the potential negative impact on markets, I've said it before, but I'll say it again that, you know, this, we, could, we should be close to the peak uh, in terms of bond yields. Um, I, I was a little bit premature in saying that a few months ago, they did go higher, but um, I think given what we're starting to see that I, I don't think bond yields should go a lot higher from where they are at the moment. Um, this has stopped working. Hmm? Okay, sorry. Aussie dollar, look, I'm running out of time a little bit, but Aussie dollar, it, it's actually fallen in line with my expectations. It's now down uh, just under 65 cents, and that's on the back of a continued strong US dollar and this narrowing interest rate differential between Australia and the United States. And um, again, as the as growth slows globally, I think you'll see iron ore prices potentially come under a bit more pressure uh, and that more aggressive interest rate outlook for the RB, uh, Fed. So actually, if you go back to that interest rate expectation that I had, um, the differential between Australia and the US could widen out to like a full percentage point in terms of short-term interest rates, uh, which should continue to put downward pressure on the Aussie. So I've got it going down around about 62 cents uh, by, by the middle of next year at the moment. Share market, look, I, I've had this view uh, and uh, I still think this is how it's going to sort of play out. I mean, I still see more downside on the equity markets, focusing here on the US market. And the reason is, is that if the US does go into recession, two things that happen, you know, fear overtakes greed, uh, PE rate or valuations for the market uh, tend to go lower. So at the moment, the market, as at the end of last week, was trading at about 15 times forward earnings. Uh, typically in recessions, um, it can drop to, you know, 12 to, you know, it has dropped as low as 10 uh, to 12, um, potentially around 14. Uh, but I'm penciling in, as you can see here, a not much more of a drop, you know, about to 40, just under 15. But the big difference is that we should see more earnings downgrades. And so the outlook for earnings coming down, uh, which, um, and at the moment, the markets are at an interesting point. They're starting to see signs of a slowdown in the US economy. Uh, but as we've seen the last couple of days, the mark, the first reaction of the market is to rejoice because it says, oh, that means the Fed won't need to raise rates as aggressively. It means interest rates won't keep rising. Um, which is good news uh, in one sense, but it does mean that slower economy will eventually weigh, uh, weigh on, on, on earnings growth, and that's the next leg of the market. Um, so in terms of investment themes, uh, Aussie dot, I mean, look, if you don't like the, one, one idea here is to invest in the US dollar, so it's a way of having, you know, uh, a, 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 like a cash uh, exposure, if you like, but in a, in, a, in a currency that's likely to go up. Uh, somewhat more against the Australian dollar. So 
uh, for those that may not know, we do have a uh, ETF that get, get allows you to invest in US dollars. Um, there's two actually, USD and Yank is a bit more of a, uh, a, a more of a geared exposure to the US dollar, but uh, USD is a one for one uh, type uh, ETF. So if the Auss US dollar goes up 1% against the Aussie, uh, then this will go up by 1% as well. And meanwhile, you're getting attract increasingly attractive income uh, in holding this as well as interest rates in the US so go up. Uh, the other one, you know, if you do want to hedge your portfolio, you are, are worried about more equity downside. Um, we do have um, uh, inverse ETFs, uh, ones that are designed to go up in value when the share market goes down, uh, and one of which, uh, here's an example of Bear. So it's more or less a one-for-one -one type relationship designed to give you, you know, if the market goes up 1% on any given day, this should, uh, uh, if it goes down, this should go up and vice versa. So two ways to play that is just a, a pure out, you know, in, a punting on the market going down, uh, or you have some shares you don't want to sell, um, and this is a way of partly, you know, going to cash by hedging that exposure. So if you, the share value of your shares do go down in value, um, at least the paper value goes up, it's offset by the, ink, the return you'll get on, on something like the bear fund. But vice versa, of course, if the market rallies, your the paper value of your portfolio will go up, but that will then be offset by the losses you make on bear. So effectively you are hedging, you know, going to cash at least for part of your portfolio. So just a couple of ideas in these uncertain times. The US dollar, um, because I think there's more upside to the US dollar and bear, because I do think uh, there's probably unfortunately a bit more downside in the equity market. Uh, I don't think the Australia will go into recession. Uh, and again, the, the shift by the RBA just to highlight that, I think has been important uh, yesterday. Um, but I don't think the, uh, the Fed have, have got any intention of slowing down their rate rises at the moment. Uh, and uh, we're looking at the US probably still, is my base case, going into recession, uh, meaning an, an increase in the unemployment rate of at least one to possibly 2% over the next um, uh, six to 12 months, uh, which, um, you know, suggest more downside on the markets there. That's pretty much it from me for now. Again, very quick update uh, on the situation. Um, so still a time for caution, um, but you know, central banks are doing their job. And I think good news here is that I think we'll come out of this with um, with a uh, we're back to a low uh, low inflation environment, uh, and then as well, interest rates can come back down somewhat from where they are. Um, and equity markets, of course, you know, they'll go through their cycle, we'll have a down cycle, but then we may well roar back uh, as things stabilise. And uh, things like technology, things like growth, uh, growth exposures, uh, which did well in the low interest rate, low inflation world prior to COVID, uh, I think will do well again uh, once we get inflation uh, back under control. I'll leave it with you on that point and uh, happy to take any questions. Perfect, David, and thank you everyone for uh, writing through those questions. We do have time for a few of them. Um, obviously, just off what you covered there in terms of looking at uh, Aussie versus US dollar and seeing, I guess, relative US dollar strength, there's a question here. So if Australian households are more sensitive to interest rate rises, meaning the RBA has to raise by less than the Fed, that would arguably mean that the US dollar gains strength. Um, the end result of this is that's going to obviously increase, you know, the cost of in imports, energies into Australia. Mm -hmm. How does this actually align with the RBA's 2.3% target based on that? Yeah, good question. I mean, that is one of the, I guess, the um, balancing considerations the RBA has to has to weigh up. I mean, it's all well and good to say, yeah. So, I mean, to the extent the RBA lags the, uh, the Fed, so if it doesn't raise rates as aggressively as the Fed, the interest rate differential between us and the US um, narrows uh, and all else constant, you know, it's more attractive to invest in US dollars than Australian dollars. So it puts downward pressure on the uh, the um, the uh, Aussie and then in turn upward pressure on imported inflation to the extent we import uh, uh, um, goods and services in US dollars. So, you know, you've got to weigh up that in increase in inflation in the short run from the currency versus, you know, not needing to raise rates that much, so it's a balancing act. Now, one point I would say is is that the Aussie, you know, when you think about inflation in Australia and the currency, you can't just think about the Aussie versus the US dollar because it's really the, the it's our the average exchange rate against you know the yen, the euro, uh, the Chinese uh, currency as well. So it's what we call the trade weighted index, uh, and that hasn't fallen as much 
again, so part, if you think about it, the Aussie is off, I, I ran the numbers, like, Aussie's off something like 15% uh, from the US dollar from its high back in April. Uh, but on a trade weighted index, the currency is only down around about five or six percent. So, um, so a lot of the uh, a good chunk of the reason we've weakened against the US dollar is because the US dollar has basically been strong uh, globally. Um, and so against other currencies, we haven't fallen as much. And in fact, against some currencies, we've actually gone up in value. So at this stage, it's not a the concern about the currency uh, is not a barrier for the RBA to feel the need to follow the Fed. Um, at this point, but again, it, it will be something they will obviously need to consider and they, they won't allow themselves to fall too far behind um, on that. Excellent, thank you, you David. Um, there's another question here, it, it goes, it seems like retail sales in Australia is still a big concern of the RBA. Do you think higher retail sales number is due to a major change in the way consumers think about budgeting versus historically? Mm -hmm. Are consumers bigger spenders instead of savers these days? Yeah, look, I think it's more, it's more the, um, look, partly we're still enjoying the the, the rebound, the, 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 the rebound from the restrictions, you know, for, for many months uh, in 2020 and 2021, we've been, you know, constrained from going out shopping, constrained from going on holidays. Um, at the same time, we've had a lot of fiscal uh, support. Uh, so household savings rates, we basically got a lot of income, you know, support from the government. Um, you know, and, and we haven't had a capacity to spend it. So the household savings rate went up. Uh, households are cashed up to an extent. Uh, and now they've been let loose to go and spend. And uh, as I showed with that uh, retail sales chart earlier, um, one of the fears of COVID is that when we went into lockdown, that as we reopened again, households would be scarred and they would be too scared to go out and spend. Uh, it's been anything other, uh, it's been complete opposite. And, and so that's the, um, you know, the, 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 the shift, if anything. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's been a change in our underlying uh, savings patterns. It's more, we were locked down, we're free, we're out, we're spending, and when we're cashed up, so we're going to spend. Uh, but the RBA is trying to rein that in to some extent now by raising rates. It hasn't had much of a dent on consumer spending yet because it's been pushing against the sort of, uh, bounce from the reopening. I mean, the momentum uh, from spending associated with reopening the economy. So it's been pushing, you know, one's been pushing one direction, interest rates have been pushing the other. But uh, the RBA will eventually, I think higher rates will eventually wear down on spending um, and uh, that will help slow the economy uh, through next year. Not cause a recession at this stage. Again, within wage, again, I, I focus on wage inflation. And if, if, if wage inflation stays where it is, if there's some hiccup in our economy, um, for whatever reason, global uh, imbalance, the RBA will change its tune and cut interest rates. Uh, because at the moment, we don't need to go into recession. And as a result, we, you know, the RBA, I think, will try hard to avoid us going into recession. Perfect. Another question here, you mentioned uh, on the last couple of slides there, in terms of you think iron ore potentially could be coming off. Uh, the question here is, uh, why is that view when, you know, potentially China, given, I guess, your other concern that you highlighted mm. was around the, the property market there, will China be sort of supporting that or, or getting mm. them way through it by, you know, going through another one of these sort of infrastructure super cycles? Uh, yeah, look, good question. And uh, it, look, it remains to be seen how much they do. do I mean, see, China themselves uh, have a balancing act as well. China doesn't want to have to rely on infrastructure programs, uh, property. I mean, basically relied on residential property development for many uh, for many years, um, and it's led to a bit of a bubble in housing construction. Uh, but they're very reliant on that form of growth to support the economy uh, at a time when you know consumer spending broadly is still not as as a bigger part of the economy it is in as in some other um, Western economies. So, for uh, as an example, so China, you know, doesn't want to have to rely on debt fueled top-down uh, infrastructure and property-related um, um, spending uh, and activity, uh, but at the moment it's got no choice. And so it's weighing up, you know, how much to stimulate versus um, uh, how much to sort of, you know, wean itself off, um, you know, the, the high debt levels. Um, so I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I think broadly speaking, the um, if the US economy goes into recession, Europe goes into recession, 
China may help at the margin by stimulating, but broadly speaking, I think commodity prices and iron ore prices in that environment go down. So notwithstanding the potential stimulus from China, I think the the, the bigger issue is uh, is um, the outlook for the US and um, and um, you know the, and Europe, uh, which may weigh on things. Perfect. And we've got time for one more and a bit of a doozy here for you as well. So what are your thoughts of the Bank of England buying five billion dollars of bonds per day again, whilst at the same time raising interest rates? So mm. loosening and tightening at the same time, it's I guess quite yes. confusing. Yeah, it is a confusing situation. I mean, look, I think in 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 um, and the, I mean, I think, look, in the UK, they 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 did risk um, getting a uh, you know a speculative um, uh, you know speculation getting getting out of hand. I mean, we had the situation where we had a, a very unfavourable reaction to the budget. Uh, where they cut taxes and a surprising cut in the top marginal tax rate. At the same time as the US, uh, sorry, the UK has high inflation and the and the Bank of England was raising rates to basically push the economy into recession, as is the Fed, I think, slowly but surely trying to do, uh, with the view that that's the only sustainable way to get inflation down. And so you've got the uh, Bank of England trying to slow growth, pushing it into recession, and you've got the government trying to do the opposite and saying, no, we're going to promote growth. And so the, the combination of those two led to the, uh, the, you know, the fear that the Bank of England would need to be incredibly aggressive in raising short term rates to offset the fiscal stimulus, which in turn saw bond yields go up, uh, which in turn put a lot of pressure on the pension funds that the, because they, they own a lot of bonds effectively through derivatives and they were directly and they were copying a lot of losses. And there was some risk that you know some could become insolvent if the bond market, uh, the speculative you know bond yield sort of went on a sort of you know uh, a negative spiral if you like. And so the ba Bank of England felt the need to step in to at least keep a lid on longer term bond yields, which is what matters for the pension funds and their balance sheets, whilst at the same time you know still looking to raise short term rates to slow the economy. So it is a mixed, confusing picture. I'm not sure the policymakers know exactly know, you know, how it's all going to play out, but they basically don't want the pension funds to become insolvent. They don't want a GFC type event uh, in the city of London, uh, but they still do want to slow the economy and get inflation down. So how they juggle that? Um, well, at the moment, they're juggling it through the, uh, the through again, keeping a lid on bond yields, um, but, but nonetheless raising uh, short-term interest rates. And we've seen also the government you know, uh, um, cut. You know, um, backtrack on some of the tax cuts, particularly the uh, the cut in the top tax tax rate. And so I think that's helped stabilise conditions somewhat in the UK. But again, it's a very uh, very messy picture at the moment uh, over there. Excellent, David. And look, we've got the request for one more question. So sorry to keep everyone, but look, a lot of our uh, people on the webinar have sort of all agreed that you know this is a, a potentially a bear market sort of rally that we are seeing. Just to help, I guess, everyone on the webinar, what are the sort of key indicators that they can be looking at to see when the market potentially is on a more of a sustainable trajectory from the bottom now? That's a very yeah. hard thing to, to pick, but what are the things yeah. that you would, you would be looking at to sort of make that call? Look, in the short term, US inflation is the absolute single most important indicator in the markets at the moment. So again, those CPI numbers, when they come out, if they are better than expected and for a, 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 you know two or three months at least a consistent run of better than expected inflation numbers that sees the Fed uh, effectively pivot like go, become a little less hawkish more open-minded to the fact that maybe we don't need a recession to get inflation down then that would be a, a, a you know the markets obviously start rallying on those CPI numbers but what you would need is is confirmation that the Fed believes those numbers are good and are going to be remain sustainably good, and so the Fed pivot. As soon as you get hints of a decent, you know, the Fed uh, pivoting because of inflation, um, then that would be a bottom. Now, the other way it can happen, where the Fed eventually pivots, is not necessarily good for markets. Is if you if you get more signs of a slowdown in the economy and recession, um, you know, employment growth going from you know plus two hundred thousand a month to minus two hundred thousand a month. Um, you're going to get interest rates will start falling, the Fed will pivot, the Fed will stop raising rates. But that's where I said the problem buying into that environment is that you're going to get probably substantial earnings downgrades. Uh, and, and markets, look, they may try to look through that depending on 
um, you know, how 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 deep the, the recession is and again, and how stubborn inflation is at that time. Because if inflation remains stubbornly high and the economy does go into recession, that's going to be the worst of all worlds because you'll have the earnings slowing, um, but the Fed not really changing tune all that much or not looking to cut interest rates. So it's really juggling all those factors at the moment. So it's hard to be, you know, it's hard to be definitive in terms of uh, what, uh, how this plays out. My base case is that you need a US recession to get inflation down. Uh, the average decline in the US share market during a recession is around about 35%. Uh, we're at its lows of last week, we're down 25%, um, allowing for earnings downgrades and maybe not more, much more of a PE downgrade to the market. That's you know, consistent with you know, maybe another 10% on the downside. Um, but, uh, and you know, in a worst case scenario, something like the GFC or even the, the tech bubble of back in 2000, we had the markets decline by 50%. Um, so uh, all I'm saying at the moment is um, inflation in the US is proving stubborn. The Fed are not changing their tune. They wanna slow the economy. Uh, and in this environment, it's still a time for caution. And I think it's overly optimistic at the moment to think the markets have bottomed. Um, but look, if you want to take a one to two year view, I think on a one year basis, there's probably a greater than 50% chance markets will be higher on a one year basis. So if you're prepared to look through the short term pain uh, and focus on the longer term, you know, we're already 25% off in the US market. Uh, we're off 15 odd, odd percent in the Australian market. Um, and we will get through this and come out the other side. Um, but so it's a question of, you know, how, how uh, tactical you want to be. Um, how long, you know, whether you see opportunities to, to start buying, you know, areas of, of good value for the longer term, things like technology, um, for example, the NASDAQ. Um, I think there's more downside in the short run, but on a one year view, uh, I think it will be higher than where it is at the moment. Excellent. Well, thank you again, David. Thank you very much for coming today. And thank you for all everyone attending the webinar today. I just quickly flick back onto this side again, things to consider, obviously investment risks, no guarantee future outcomes are uncertain. And again, just reiterating that it was only general information provided today's webinar, but thank you all that will be getting sent out very shortly and please do join us for the next webinar coming up shortly. Thank you. Bye for now.